oldest mineral ever measured on Earth, which is found in Australia. Some of the oldest rocks still preserving organic materials occur in Washington, Australia. It's uniquely because it's a continent that was able to preserve a lot of that geological history because it didn't have a, a very drastic tectonic history. Yet, it's a very tectonically active continent. This is the fastest moving continental landmass migrating north at a rate of about five to seven centimeters per year. It's like a big truck on the road running over bumps on Tom, on Tom Java Plateau, Papua New Guinea, and that's essentially what Australia has been doing so for the past 40 million years. A lot of times, how, how fresh something is comes across in a color because it's, it's denser, more crystalline, or more porous. The reason why this rock is rusty is because it had sulfides. When you have a mineral that has reduced iron and reduced sulfur, and you put it in contact with the atmosphere, and it begins to oxidize, it generates a huge amount of sulfuric acid. There are some places in the world, like there's a place in California, Mount Shasta, in which they dumped all the sulfides in river systems, and, and the water now in that area has a pH of minus three. Now you think pH of zero is the limit, right? But it's not. So unless you know virology, you cannot understand your science. What, what differentiates earth sciences and environmental sciences is our understanding of material properties of earth materials. And mineralogy is what gives us an understanding of the material properties of natural products on earth. Be very careful. From where I am, it's a nice drop. The mineralogy side is really interesting. Yeah. Um, it's fun. It's a small department, as it means you get to know everyone really well. Okay. So these are little features that you see on a rock like this that if you don't notice, you don't understand the context of inflation. We can identify minerals by smelling a rock. We can identify minerals by tasting a rock. Unless you understand what minerals occur in which environment, you really cannot understand the processes that actually occur in that environment, how a man-made process will affect that environment. The reason why I wanted to do geology, I wanted to mix um, physical sciences with an outdoor sort of aspect, um, and I thought geology was uh, a very good way of doing that. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere between 30 and 45 percent of us economic activity, the GDP of Australia actually depends on the earth sciences, on the natural resources sector, our exports of coal, iron ore, and other commodities combined probably account for 50% uh, of all the commodity export in Australia. Geophysics is quite integrated. We think of geophysics as something quite different from, uh, from mineralogy, but when we measure the physical properties of earth materials, what we measure is the physical properties of the minerals that occur in that material. Everyone's expected to have some knowledge of all the different disciplines that you have to deal with. Those of you who haven't done any geophysics before, what geophysics is all about is using the physical properties of rocks to trigger something that we can detect. This other instrument is not measuring the susceptibility directly, this is a magnetometer. This is measuring the effect that the rocks are having on the Earth's magnetic field, in other words, the distortion introduced into the Earth's magnetic field by the rocks. If you want to understand the magnetic properties of the minerals in a large area, for example, five kilometers by five kilometer, you can actually do an uh, electromagnetic survey or you can do an aeromagnetic survey. You can get very, very representative spatial properties with the geophysical tools that we have. It's going to be a horn filter. That's got way That's more epidemic than what we had before. That's essentially why geophysics is so important, because it allows us to understand what we try to do by looking at rocks and minerals, but actually with quantitative tools and applied in a much more representative way. I, I like the outdoors and I, I guess sort of, uh, I, I like practical things that seem sort of like they easily translate to being useful for society, so yeah, I am sort of hanging on the spring, so when it's plugged in the ground like so, the ground shakes, which you get a relative between four and eight.
The course with Steve's been really great. He's probably been one of the best lecturers I've ever encountered at uni, actually, um, and especially in terms of making concepts that seem, you know, tough for most people, quite quite easy and accessible. It definitely seems like a, a good university. You know, you certainly, I guess you hear things like, um, you know, that we're supposedly up in the, the top three in the country, and, yeah, you know, you want to get a, a competitive education. No. So, so what that means is that in most scenarios you see a lot of these refracted waves happening. Right? Yeah, just, just have a look at six and make sure it's hooked up properly. So the possibility is um, this will be your sub soil rocks. This could be a um, uh, water saturated soil, yep. which will have a velocity of about 1500, and this could be um, uh, dry soil, which will have low velocity. That's why we carry our geology field trips, trying to combine mineralogy, the study of formation of ore deposits, the environmental consequences of those ore deposits, and combining all of that with using geophysical tools to characterize the material.